Uh, today, we're going to talk about the year that broke politics, collusion and chaos in the presidential election of 1968. We are joined by Dr. Luke Nichter, a distinguished author with a deep passion for American history and politics to discuss his new book by that title. Together, we're going to explore the 1968 presidential race and the time in which it was occurring, such bitter division within the United States, marked by the tragic assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy, characterized by contentious debates on issues such as the Vietnam War and increasing rates of crime. The year that broke politics reshapes our understanding of a critical moment in 20th century American history. This is the first rigorously researched historical account of the most controversial issues that were going on at that time. And the book has cooperation from all four major sides of the general election. Lyndon Johnson's participation, Hubert Humphrey, Richard Nixon, and George Wallace. Dr. Nichter uh, co conducted approximately 85 separate interviews with family members and former staffers, in addition to extensive archival research and access to new evidence that dramatically changes our understanding of the election. This amazing work received a National Endowment for Humanities Fellowship and provides an eye-opening account of the political calculations and maneuvering that decided this fiercely fought election. Our featured author, Dr. Luke Nichter, is a professor of history and the James Cavanaugh Endowed Chair in Presidential Studies at Chapman University. But we know that presidential studies all always include how do they deal with the Congress? Um, his areas of expertise include the Cold War, the modern presidency, US political and diplomatic history, and a particular focus on what he calls the long 1960s, spanning from John F. Kennedy to Watergate. He is a leading authority on the confidential White House recordings of Franklin Roosevelt through Richard Nixon and wrote an authoritative account of their taping systems commissioned by the White House Historical Association. He is the author of The Last Brahmin, Harry Cabot Lodge and the Making of the Cold War. He has been interviewed by numerous outlets and now divides his time between Orange, California and Bowling Green, Ohio. And we are honored to have Dr. Nichter with us today. Tell us about 1968. What did we learn and what does it mean for today? Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction and hope you can all uh, uh, hear me and see my shared screen okay. Um, I, I think first I'll say uh, as a former staffer at C-SPAN uh, about a dozen years ago, uh, helping them to start American History TV, which is still going strong on the weekends, what a pleasure it was to always cover events at the U.S. Capitol Historical Society and just the consistent high level of quality. So certainly I'll try to keep that going here today. And uh, as you say, three uh, three of the four major, uh, not stars, co-stars, I think in this story, uh, spent so much time at the Capitol as legislators in the, in the House and the Senate over the years. So it, it certainly is a book about presidential politics, but also certainly the, the legislative branch figures largely as well in the story. And I, I think what, what I'll start is by saying um, kind of a brief overview of my approach to this subject, because obviously it's terrain that a lot of other authors have been over. And then uh, the majority of uh, our, our time will be to focus on some of the new evidence that's in the book. Uh, those who might have followed some of my past work there, which you described, know that uh, source material, especially newly released source material, almost always figures largely in, in my works. Uh, but often, uh, also, I'm aware, though, that, that what I say is not the final word. Uh, it's a, the history is a, as people will say to me sometimes, you know, I, I was never very good in history because I couldn't memorize people, places, or dates. And history is really much more than that. It's a, it's a debate that really never ends. Uh, 
about who we are as a people, uh, how we got here, and maybe even offers a glimpse of, of where we're headed. Uh, so uh, certainly this is what I, what I have here in this book and today is is not the final word, but I think it does uh, run the ball down the field quite a bit in, in terms of advancing our understanding. So this is a book, as I say, that really focuses on the four major sides at the time and, and to refresh your memory, especially for younger members of the audience. You know, we're talking about outgoing uh, President Lyndon Johnson. We're talking about uh, his then vice president who becomes a Democratic nominee later that year, Hubert Humphrey. We're talking about, as we knew him at the time, former Vice President Richard Nixon, who would go on to be the Republican nominee that year. And uh, as, as we knew him then, former and future governor of Alabama, George Wallace, running on a third party ticket, the American Independent Party. Uh, he had been a, a Southern Democrat uh, up to that point, uh, but wanted in 68 to be free to criticize both parties. And so I thought the vehicle of a third party offered him a way, a way to do that. And the book really offers a, a, a little bit uh, for each of these sides. Uh, you know, I'm a bit of a cynic, and when I see a new political book, political history book, that voice inside my head, some, you know, often wonders what's the author's angle or take, or is there an agenda or a favorite here? And I think, uh, I've because I've heard readers and reviewers across the spectrum have said this. That that I th I think that if if for the about the eighty five or so that I interviewed from the four sides the the, the kids you know as we as I call them they're not kids anymore from uh, the Johnson Humphrey Nixon Wallace families but also the former staffers I think if they read that part of the book I think they I, I think I really tried to get it mostly right in terms of presenting their story the way they perceived the events of that year as they unfolded and, and were reacting to them just like many Americans you know who went to the polls that November. And so I offer a little bit of everything, uh, the, and and the 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 bulk of um, I would say the most controversial argument in in the book ultimately, which you kind of grasp by the the cover image on, on the book itself, the sort of almost silhouette like image of, of Johnson and Nixon talking at the White House uh, during the transition between those two administrations, uh, is the is is the argument that Johnson ultimately came to prefer Nixon as his own successor. Uh, not particularly because he liked Nixon, which is really un unknowable to me and, and perhaps even irrelevant, but because Johnson came to view having Nixon as his successor was better for his own personal legacy, LBJ's legacy. And so that's kind of my starting point here where uh, this is kind of, I think, maybe the most interesting part of the book is some of the new evidence that's in here and is the thing that that I'd, I'd like to focus on for, for the bulk of our, our presentation. Uh, but obviously, there's lots of directions we could go during Q&A, and, and I'd be happy to do that. And certainly anyone who doesn't have time to ask a question here during the event, I'm easy to look up and, and we can continue the conversation offline as well. But you know, how, how did I go down this road um, of, of this you know, ultimate argument in the book? Uh, well, at first, to be completely candid, was not something that I expected. You know, I, I, I wish I could say I was so brilliant to have foreseen or anticipated the direction but th this is really the process of, of going down the, the, the research rabbit hole. Uh, you, re you really don't know what you're going to, uh, going to expect. I mean, you go in with sort of ideas and, and a framework, but you have to be a little bit, you can't be overly rigid. You've got to be prepared uh, to make some discoveries and, and, and navigate based on those and, and, and allow them, frankly, to challenge your preconceived ideas. And, and so that, that's certainly the case here. And so this this kind of how I went down this road, uh, ultimately, with this argument in the book was re really emanated from a conversation I had in December of 2017 with former Vice President Walter Mondale. And so there's a photo of us here. Uh, I uh, One of us is clearly prepared for single digit weather in Minneapolis in December, and one of us was not. And in hindsight, I probably should have dressed up a little, little more than I did. Uh, I didn't know he was going to come wearing a suit. But I was there actually to uh, to get to know the Humphrey side more. Um, I was finishing a book at the time, a biography of Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., this sort of liberal Republican, longtime legislator uh, in this in the Senate, beginning in 1937, had been a senator for three different times and come back each time. And I was there to uh, look at Humphrey's papers uh, to get to know. I, I met with other members of the Humphrey clan, so to speak, including his son uh, Hubert the Third, known as Skip. Uh, Don and Arvon Fraser were a fascinating couple. Uh, they're both gone now. And they had first met during Humphrey's 1948 Senate campaign. And then this man right here, uh, Walter Mondale, who really I, I expected to be sort of the least interesting of that visit in terms of those that I would talk to. 
And this happens sometimes. Um, clearly, he's the biggest name of those I would talk to, most recognizable name, went on to be vice president with President Carter and his own presidential run in 84. Uh, but I was asking him about, about an earlier time in his political career when I didn't expect him really to say much. In 1968, he was Senator Walter Mondale. He had Humphrey's old Senate seat in, 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 the, in the upper chamber. He was co-chair of uh, Humphrey's presidential campaign in 1968, along with Senator Fred Harris. Although sometimes I knew in history that was more of a ceremonial role than a substantive role, so I didn't know that he had much to say. But the part that surprised me, because it went well beyond what he wrote in his memoir, um, I, I brought a copy of for him to sign that day because I and I, I tend to forget when these meetings took place. And, and now that he's gone too, it, it's sort of a cherished keepsake I have of our, our, our meeting that day. Um, but what surprised me was he talked about during the 1970s, how, how much of a, how close he became to Humphrey. They became friends and he said, uh, Humphrey helped me to negotiate my role as vice president with, with President Carter. And we, he said in particular, we, uh, uh, we talked about 1968, he said many times over the years, the 1960s, 1970s, before Humphrey was was taken uh, at a tragically young age uh, due to due to cancer late in that decade, and what surprised me the most about Humphrey, after we got through kind of the questions that I had brought, he said some nice things about Henry Cabot Lodge that I could use in that book, which came out about three years ago. But toward the end, he said something to me like, "Do you want to know what I really think about 1968?" And I said, "Sure." He said, "President Johnson absolutely did not want Hubert Humphrey to win in 1968." And he said it that way. He repeated it again. He said it a second time. And I was stunned to hear that. That, that was not part of the conventional wisdom. And as my thought process just you know, evolved during the conversation, I thought, what did that mean? And so it just kind of came out. I said, well, what did that mean? Do you think Johnson wanted Nixon to win in 1968? And he sort of paused. And you know, we were seated right here in the picture. He was sitting at the chair right in front there at the end of this long, lawyerly-like conference room. I was sitting at the, the seat on his right. You can see just a, a glimpse of the armrest there. And he looked kind of down toward the left of this photo down. And kind of then his gaze came back to me. And he said, maybe, maybe. And I really took that as a challenge to sort of begin to look more into that subject somehow and, and really do, try to document and recreate what Lyndon Johnson's mindset might have been. So many books write him off as of March 31st, 1968, when he went on television and in a so stunning ending um, of a Viet, really mostly a Vietnam speech, announced that he would not run for re-election and would not accept the nomination of his party that year. And, and so I, I, this book really restores Johnson to a central place that I, th I think he occupied for the remainder of that year. While he might have shifted his energies away from the ballot uh, to his remaining months in office, I think he was deeply involved in the choice of his successor, understanding that who your successor is and what they stand for and the policies that they advocate can be awfully important to your place in history. And so Mondale, I felt, had given me a challenge to, to figure this out. Two months later, uh, again, another unexpected event, Reverend Billy Graham, who doesn't seem like an obvious figure here, not, not on the ballot in 1968, certainly, but probably you know, might have been as, as important or more important than anyone not on the ballot in 1968. Uh, Graham suddenly died two months after my meeting with uh, Mondale in December of 2017. Graham dies in February of 2018 at age 99. And a process that began that continues to this day is the opening of his vast archival papers at what is now the Billy Graham Library and Archive in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, which 70 years of personal papers. I mean, it's almost like a presidential library in terms of the volume of material. Uh, and so this is a process that goes on now. And it's like, when I read about his, um, his death, uh, I, I, I talk regularly to archivists and kind of learn what's new, what collections might you be opening soon, what have you gotten in, what's interesting, and sometimes you don't learn very much, and sometimes they, they tell you things. And an archivist at Wheaton College uh, in Illinois, just outside of Chicago, told me we have this Billy Graham material, which was only open a brief period of time, just before the pandemic, and it's since been all been moved down to be consolidated in Charlotte. Uh, and, and it might be open to this day, but I, I'm, I'm not really sure of the status. I haven't been back to do this, to, to, to check on this. But she said, you might want to come take a look at this. This might be important for a book on the election of 1968. 
And so this is some of the interesting material that really is featured in, in the book. And there's a, a section of uh, Graham's papers, again, 70 years of personal papers uh, that, that I would call the Graham diary. Uh, he called it officially his VIP notebooks, al although there were part of it that he does actually refer to as a diary. He uses that word. These uh, and because Graham lived to be lives to be so old, age ninety nine in twenty eighteen, this part of his personal records uh, grew to be fifty two volumes by the time of his death, and I, I would describe it as being a kind of hybrid diary. I mean, there are parts where it is a written daily reflection. There are parts where he kind of catches it up periodically when 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 he has time or when something important occurs. There are parts where it's dictated. Uh, and really what it documents, I, I would say it's part diary, part scrapbook that do documents contact with presidents beginning in 1950 with Harry Truman and goes all the way to 2014 with President Obama. And it's, I would say it's verbatim contact with presidents, their families, and top staff. Sometimes it might even be something like a White House lunch menu thrown in there that has something that Graham might have scratched on the reverse side or maybe something that a president said to him that he would document. And so this is a vast uh, collection that's really going to reshape presidential history, not just evangelical or religious history, which might seem like the obvious thing, but really this is uh, deeply into political and presidential history. I was only allowed to see a portion of it for the, for the 1960s. It's still restricted. These are still privately owned by the Grahams in Charlotte. I had to receive permission from the general counsel's office to see what you see in the book. And even here in this presentation, I will use a few excerpts from it, but only those that appear in the book. That way I don't kind of go beyond, you know, the permissions that I sought. But I find this absolutely fascinating and, and suggest, uh, it, it, and I'll get to it a little bit later, but it really uh, challenged me to revise what I thought about this election. Uh, I, I thought this note here is fascinating, to be used for memoirs only, then destroyed. <laughs> I'm sure glad it wasn't. Uh, but my, I guess my bottom line kind of takeaway in terms of Graham's maneuvering in 1968, his activities. By the late 1960s, Graham had known all of these key figures, Johnson, Nixon, Wallace, uh, Humphrey, and even uh, former President Dwight Eisenhower, while his health is in decline, is still active, and his endorsement is powerful in 1968. Former, uh, at the time, Governor California Governor Ronald Reagan was a factor, whether he might jump in and be a full candidate. And I would I estimated at one point that Graham knew each of these names I just mentioned about an average of 20 years as they were as he was reaching the peak of their of his profession as as they were reaching theirs. And I really take away, and this kind of becomes the theme of the remainder of the slides here and the examples from the Graham diary that I'll feature, that Graham really had three goals uh, with respect to the 1968 election. One, uh, uniting the conservative vote, or at least preventing it from being split between the two parties, which is a real chance, especially with Wallace in the race and, and with Reagan possibly coming into the race. Two, convincing Nixon to run, which might have seemed like a foregone conclusion, but I came away that it was much more tentative, that he really was on the fence late, uh, even into January of 68, and wasn't sure if he was going to go through it in Graham's decisive role. And then three, bringing together LBJ and Nixon so that they understood they needed each other ultimately for, for each other's own legacies. And so with step one, sort of uniting the conservative vote, or at least, uh, again, preventing its split, this was a, a bipartisan issue back then. There were conservatives in both parties. There were conservative Democrats. There were conservative Republicans. And the, the, this outreach that Graham has takes place with a number of individuals, some of whom I've already mentioned, Eisenhower, Reagan, uh, Mark Hatfield of Oregon, James Gardner, head of the North Carolina delegation at the Republican convention. But first and foremost is Eisenhower, because Graham wanted to make sure that Eisenhower would not in, in, endorse another candidate. Uh, he had been seen as friendly on the golf course with, with Reagan in California. Some of the press had even suggested that that, that was really Eisenhower's preferred candidate. And so uh, first for Graham, it was bringing the Eisenhower and bring Eisenhower and, and Nixon together and even their families together as Graham at the time was even encouraging the dating relationship between David Eisenhower and, and Julie Nixon. And so there's one segment of here that I think is is interesting here. You don't need to read the whole thing on yeah, each one of these pages. I'll just read a, a couple of uh, sentences and give you a, a, just a feel of what the diary says. 
So that toward the top here at the, at the end of that first line, uh, just before I was to leave, so this is Graham writing in the first person, he said, and he is Eisenhower, Billy, there's something I want you to do for me. Uh, I, he said, you're going to see Dick Nixon tonight. I said, yes. He said, I always felt since 1956 there's been a little something between Dick and me. I've never been able to put my finger on it, but I think it goes back to the day I called him in and told him that I wanted him to decide whether he wanted to be my running mate that year or not. And this has been written up a lot in history, the, the either the awkward relationship or lack of a relationship or negative uh, relationship between Eisenhower and Nixon. In 1956, uh, Eisenhower suggested that Nixon go off the ticket, and this has been largely interpreted as a demotion or a lack of satisfaction in, in Nixon as vice president. And what the Graham Diary really shows is, is a different perspective on this, that Eisenhower being kind of an old school, I mean, he's a five-star general in the army, he understood that as vice president, you don't have a lot of constitutional duties. And in terms of prepa pre preparing for the possible presidency one day, he felt that Nixon needed more executive experience, either to run a large cabinet department, to be to, to have in industry experience in private industry, or to be governor of a, of a large state, perhaps, uh, would give you that experience. But yeah, I think Nixon took it almost as a, as a negative. It was not a good experience for Nixon. And so the first thing uh, Graham wanted to do was to make sure that that relationship uh, was okay, that if Nixon had run for presidency, run for the president, as he would go on to do, that Eisenhower wouldn't come out and, and ultimately endorse someone else. And in the follow-up letter taken from another part of the diary, um, Graham's follow-up uh, to Eisenhower uh, after Eisenhower's request for Graham to, to reach out to Nixon, uh, this is Graham writing very carefully and very delicately, I approached Mr. Nixon about the problem you raised on my last visit. I sincerely believe, dear friend, that such a problem does not exist. I seriously doubt if there's any man anywhere in the world that loves you as much as he does, as, you, as he does, he owes most of his political prominence to you. <laughs> so I think step one, there's more to it in the diary, but kind of to make sure that relationship was okay, that Nixon's candidacy wouldn't be derailed by the senior figure in the party, who was, who was very personally popular still, and everyone wanted Eisenhower's endorsement, that he wouldn't come out for someone else. Another interesting aspect about uh, not allowing the conservative vote to be divided was the role of John Connolly, who was really an uh, outgoing uh, governor of Texas at the time, as close to LBJ as you could be and not have the last name Johnson, I, I would argue, in 1968. Talk of him going on uh, the vice presidential ticket with Humphrey that year. Um, you know, Johnson recruited Connolly to be one of his very first congressional staffers in the House in 1937, at a time when Connolly was still student body president at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, so uh, Connolly was a really important figure by 1968. And uh, here's a, a letter to Nixon from Graham, which put an excerpt. As you know, I'm going to San Antonio, Texas week after next for a major crusade. I will be seeing John, Governor John Connolly. In my opinion, if he joins the ticket as a vice presidential candidate, he will greatly influence the South. You know, people sometimes say to me, what could Humphrey have done differently, possibly to have won that year? I think this is one thing he could have done to get across the finish line, that if he had gotten, say, a Connolly on the ticket, it would have denied a lot of votes from the Johnson moderates who I think either sat on their hands or went for Nixon and uh, had brought those over to their traditional Democratic base. And what the Graham diary goes on to suggest, uh, not detail exactly, but to strongly suggest is that at the Chicago convention in, in, uh, where the Democrats were meeting in 1968, that Connolly, uh, that Graham had intervened with Connolly and had said, if you stay off the ticket and stay away from Humphrey, that a future Nixon administration will give you a cabinet post, which ultimately is what happened in 1971 when Connolly became Secretary of Treasury. Really, as I see it now, really almost putting LBJ at the cabinet table you know, in the Nixon administration, which is a fascinating concept to think, linking those two presidencies uh, ultimately in, in history. And then a couple more samples I have here, which which are I think are particularly interesting. Um, step two, convincing Nixon to run. Uh, I think he was much more on the fence than, than we, we understood at the time, having lost narrowly in 1960 to Kennedy and Johnson, and then having been defeated more decisively from the California governorship in 1962 for Pat Brown, I think Nixon was broken. Uh, it was called his political obituary at the time. He had really pulled up all of his political tent stakes. He moved to New York, really ended his political career. Uh, I, I think he realized how much he missed politics shortly after his arrival and when he began to practice law in New York City in 1963. 
but really slowly, you know, began to claw his way back and ultimately run in 68. But I think this was a tough decision for him. I think it, those two losses had, had really taken him to the emotional brink. It put a great strain on his family, uh, his, his wife, uh, uh, Pat, and daughters, Julie and Tricia. This was not an easy thing, you know, to jump back into. Uh, Nixon was widely called a loser. I think Nixon believed he was a loser and had to convince himself of the merits of running again, you know, for a third major campaign, you know, in, in less than 10 years. And Nixon, as well as his daughter, Julie, wrote that Graham's advice was, was really decisive. And so there's a couple of segments here, I think, that are interesting. Uh, this is Graham writing in the first person again. Mr. Nixon and I sat and talked for an hour. Uh, then we decided to walk casually down the beach. This is in Key Biscayne, Florida. We became so intense in our discussion and conversation that before, before we realized it, we walked well over a mile and a half to the lighthouse. This is the Key Biscayne Lighthouse, which is still there, a beautiful place to visit in, uh, on the island there. Uh, we turned around and walked back. I was getting weaker all the time. Uh, Graham actually had viral pneumonia. It had canceled his whole schedule. And Graham said, I really need you right now to make this decision. I'm right at the point of making it. And Nixon offered to send a private plane to, a, to the outskirts of Atlanta where Graham was. And he cleared his schedule. He wasn't well enough to travel commercially. commercially. And so Graham agreed to do this, I think, understanding that the, the importance that, that Nixon had reached in terms of finally making this decision. This is very late December, right around New Year's Day of 68, when Nixon had not made his mind up. And he was within a couple of weeks of, of that deadline to be on the New Hampshire primary ballot. And then the, the second excerpt here on the slide is Graham was getting ready to leave after his several day visit in Key Biscayne. It says, uh, Nixon said uh, to Graham, well, what was your conclusion? What should I do? And this is Graham writing in the first person. I turned to him and said, Dick, I, I think you should run. If you don't, you will always wonder whether you should have run and whether you could have run or not. You are the best prepared man in the United States to be president. I know there are certain elements of the press that are gonna cut you to pieces. There's also a serious doubt as to whether you can make it or not, but I think you owe it to yourself and to your country to run for it. Uh, two months before, Nixon's mother, Hannah, had died, and, and Graham had, had helped to officiate at her funeral in California. And on her deathbed, she said to her son, Dick, don't give up. You know, I think you have another chance. And Graham also thought Nixon was still a young man after his defeat in 1960. He was still 47. And Graham, other parts of the diary which I don't have on the screen here, uh, Graham doubted uh, or, or wondered whether his own uh, lack of action to come out more fully for Nixon in 1960 might have been the reason for his narrow defeat that year against Kennedy and Johnson. And so I think Graham also believed that Johnson would get another shot, even though it, Graham's favorite at the time was really Lyndon Johnson. They were personally close. They were kind of fellow moderate Southerners, pro-civil rights. And had Johnson stayed in that race, the Graham diary suggests it would have been an enormous test of loyalties for Graham between his really his favorite, uh, Johnson at the time, but also his friend Nixon, who he thought uh, would, would get another shot at it in 68. And uh, Graham was one of the only ones that you, you're learning in the diary that Johnson said he probably would, he, more often than not, he would probably not run in 1968. And Graham even told Nixon that in advance of March 31st. And as far as I can tell, Nixon didn't believe him. He simply didn't believe that a politician who had worked so hard to acquire political power would give it up, you know, until the moment when he really had to, that he wouldn't give it up voluntarily. And as I say, both Nixon and his daughter Julie later wrote that Graham's role here in Key Biscayne and getting Nixon to run, convincing him it was his, you want to use the word destiny, his his calling, or just that, you know, this, this was your chance, this was your window, that Graham's involvement here uh, was decisive. And then the third step, which is really the interesting part, is, is Graham bringing together LBJ and Nixon. Uh, and the first excerpt here I have on the slide, this is Graham writing, uh, one of my objectives during the past few years has been to say nice things about Johnson in the presence of Nixon and nice things about Nixon in the presence of Johnson. I could not help but feel in my heart that Nixon was gonna be the next president. And I, feel, I felt that there would come a day when they would need each other just as Johnson felt his need of Eisenhower. Uh, Johnson was always comforted by Eisenhower's uh, uh, his advice over the years, especially on domestic problems as well as on Vietnam. And as Eisenhower's health was was really fading in in the second half of 1968, he was living full time at Walter Reed at that point, uh, and being cared by by a medical team there. Uh, I think Johnson wanted to be a, a post-president, kind of in the model of Eisenhower. 
you know, to have a property that he would one day do donate the Johnson Ranch um, uh, to the National Park Service to the American people, just as Get Gettysburg, uh, the, the farm was, the Eisenhower farm there in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and to for Johnson to remain a relevant figure behind the scenes, uh, the nation's top Democrat, if he were succeeded by a Republican, and to be a relevant figure kind of behind the scenes. And what you see in the book is that there's nothing static about Lyndon Johnson in 1968. He was reacting to unfolding events just as many Americans were. He, as I said earlier, he uh, announcing in March 31st that he would not run again. I think initially at that time, uh, Senator Robert Kennedy's campaign was beginning to surge and really take off. And Johnson was concerned about that. And much has been written about their relationship uh, or lack of. And I think at the time, Johnson thought Nelson Rockefeller, the sort of liberal Republican governor of New York, would be an ideal successor to Johnson. Similarities in policy, different temperament and, and political backgrounds. But that um, Johnson, uh, that, that Rockefeller would continue a great deal of Johnson's great society and, and also um, have a similar Vietnam policy. But more importantly, that it would take really the brand name of a Rockefeller to defeat the brand name of a Kennedy. Rockefeller good looks and money and charisma would certainly be needed you know, to defeat uh, a Robert Kennedy. But then by May, uh, uh, Rockefeller began making some, some fairly critical speeches about Vietnam um, in regards to Johnson's management of the war, thanks to his then uh, Vietnam um, advisor, Professor um, Henry Kissinger of Harvard, uh, who was assisting Rockefeller at the time on those speeches. And then ultimately, um, Kennedy's defeat in the Oregon primary, uh, a leak during a Washington merry-go-round column that as attorney general, he had authorized uh, wiretap surveillance, FBI wiretap surveillance on, on, on civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King, and, and his assassination, Johnson believing really through the nomination to Humphrey at that point by default. Uh, at the, at, this is a different era. The rules had not changed with the McGovern Commission until four years later. Primaries back then weren't really binding. Humphrey didn't enter any primaries. Uh, it wasn't binding on the on the delegates. Uh, almost virtually all of the state and county chairmen, coast to coast, owed loyalty to the Johnson Humphrey administration. So when Johnson didn't run, you know, Humphrey was seen more or less to be running in his place and continuing many of the policies in, in that administration. So Humphrey inherited an overwhelming amount of support, and the, it was, I think, really the odds-on favorite to to win the nomination at that point. And what what a lot of the Johnson people told me was uh, that uh, to, Johnson believed to be president you had to have a killer instinct was the words that they used. You really had to make potentially life and death decisions about Americans and certainly in times of war. And he didn't feel that that Humphrey had a, that killer instinct to be president. And Johnson even toyed with the idea of reentering the race, even though he thought it was, you know, that door was shut tight. And this is the period where I think uh, Johnson gradually begins to come into the Nixon column, who's making fairly progressive speeches on domestic policy, is not criticizing Johnson on, on uh, uh, Vietnam. And I think Nixon perceives that with Johnson out of the race, you know, these are the two great rivals, each of their own parties and, and political and generation in American politics, uh, always facing each other on the ballot. But when not facing each other on the ballot, gradually came to see they had more in common, perhaps, than they realized. Um, and it was after Bobby Kennedy's funeral up in up in New York City. This is the second excerpt I'll get to on the slide, and then we'll we'll move forward here a little more expeditiously. Uh, this was a visit that that Graham had with Johnson in his White House bedroom in the early morning hours, a couple of days after that that Kennedy funeral. This is Graham writing. He uh, this is he is LBJ here. He said that he thought Richard Nixon was going to be elected the next president of the United States. He said Nixon is probably the best qualified man in America to be president. He said, I don't always agree with him, but I respect him for his tremendous ability. I told him, this is Graham writing the first person, I told him that if he gave me the freedom to tell Mr. Nixon just what he said, that it would be of great encouragement to Mr. Nixon. He, LBJ, said, by all means, tell him. And this was sort of the beginning, this is in the second week of June, of these direct messages being passed forth with Graham as an intermediary. And I only the only place I know of where these, these messages are documented are, are in the Graham diary. And then the peak of this messaging activity is actually in September. And so what you see on the slide here is a photo of, of uh, Graham and Nixon, both in Pittsburgh. Graham is there for uh, a, a, a rally, a crusade rally. Nixon is there uh, for a political rally, uh, but they both happen to be staying at the same hotel, the Pittsburgh Hilton, and uh, they, they have breakfast one morning. And this little excerpt here from the diary is, uh, is, is Graham discussing this meeting that they had, this breakfast meeting in Pittsburgh. It was also during the conversation that Mr. Nixon 
asked if he asked me if I'd be willing to visit President Johnson privately and give him uh, a private message from him. He said, Billy, you are the only one that could do this. And Graham really was one of the only people who knew Nixon and Johnson well to privately, you know, move back and forth. He didn't leak. He generally didn't talk to the press. This is Graham writing in the first person. I immediately, I immediately agreed that I would with the understanding there would be no publicity. He, Nixon, began to give me the points he would like for me to make to President Johnson. I immediately began to realize that this was a bit of history in the making. I took out a scratch piece of paper out of my, uh, out of my pocket and with a red pen scratched down hastily and briefly. And what you see kind of in the reverse of this, the handwriting, you don't need to, don't, no reason to struggle to read it. I'll, I'll break it up on the next couple of slides and, and kind of go through a few sam uh, excerpts from it. Is the scratch piece of paper, a copy of it from the Graham diary, as, which is exactly what Graham refers to as he was writing down these points uh, during his meeting with Nixon. Um, and so I kind of go through uh, the, the parts of this uh, uh, quickly here. There, there's, not, there's not quite as much content to go through. But first, uh, under the slide Messenger, which is there's a whole a chapter in the book where I get into this in more detail called Messenger. I think that accurately describes the, the role that Graham played here, not just between Johnson and Nixon, but even uh, Wallace is involved, Reagan, Eisenhower, even Humphrey. Graham is back and forth between all of the major figures in this campaign, playing really a unique role, not just in 68, but I, I would struggle to find another year in American politics that, that a, a non-politician played such a role. And this is Graham writing about his meeting with Johnson after seeing Nixon. On Friday, September 15th, 1968, I flew to Washington to see President Johnson. It was one of the few times I had ever asked for an appointment. And I told him it was of a private nature. He took me into his office and I took out a scratch piece of paper and went over these point by point. He was not only appreciative, but I sensed that he was touched by the gesture, this gesture on Mr. Nixon's part. It was my private judgment that this might be unprecedented in history between two leaders of the Democratic and Republican parties in these particular circumstances. And so here I'll run through these points, uh, which again, I, I, there's more in the book about this, but I just think it's so interesting to see the source material for yourself and, and, and see exactly what the content of this message was. So point one, and Graham's hand, handwriting is a little tough. These, these took me a little work, uh, but here's what I've got. Uh, this again, this is in the first person, this is Nixon to Johnson. I will never embarrass him after election. I respect him as a man and as a president. He is the hardest working and most dedicated president in 140 years. And if you rewind the clock from 18, uh, and, well, in 1968 to 1828, that puts you right into uh, the Andrew Jackson period, who was certainly a political idol for Lyndon Johnson. That would have been a, 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 a really a nice statement politically to make to Johnson. Uh, two, I want a working relationship with him and will seek his advice constantly. Three, I uh, want you to go on special assignments after election to foreign countries, which have been very prestigious you know, for a former president. Four, must point out some of the weaknesses and failures of the ad administration, but will never reflect on Mr. J personally. Five, uh, when VN, Vietnam, is settled, he, Nixon, will give you a major share of credit because you deserve it. And finally, six, we'll do everything to make you great in history because you deserve it. And you know, I, I think really this is stunning, um, a stunning act of political marksmanship by Nixon. He really gave his longtime rival, Lyndon Johnson, everything he needed at this point. I mean, imagine if this had leaked. Johnson could have blown up Nixon's campaign. Um, I mean, it really, this is an incredible moment in U.S. politics. I, I don't know of anything else quite like it, at least in modern U.S. history. Uh, so it's really kind of stunning. And as I say, there's much more in the book, but it's, it's not, I, I enjoy kind of sharing some of the source material and, and talking about it. And then as I conclude, um, I mean, this is a book about 1968, obviously, uh, but, but I, I think it really challenges me to think more broadly about U.S. politics. And, and I came across kind of late in the research in oral history at the LBJ Library. Hey, they have a great oral history project there. And they have an interview with Graham done about 10 years later uh, than most of the oral histories. You know, oral histories are supposed to be with administration officials. Graham was certainly not an official of any administration. So they called it a special interview. And as far as I can tell, it was Lady Bird Johnson who wanted Graham to sit for this interview. This is in 1983. And I have a couple lines here, just from the very closing of the, of the interview transcript. Uh, Monroe Billington says, well, Dr. Graham, I don't want to keep you. I know how busy you are, but you've answered some questions. 
And Graham responds, I'm, I'm sorry to be so, you know, if you can think of other things, I'll be available for another conversation. There are some incidents that would be historical that people don't, don't know about that I'm not free yet to tell. And the weight of those lines, whether it refers to what I've talked about here or whether even things that I don't know about yet. You know, much of the Graham diary is still restricted. I was not allowed to see it. I used here what I was allowed to use in the book. And so I've tried to share a piece of this with you today. But I think, you know, um, this has been 55 years since 1968. And I really think, you know, 50 years is just enough in terms of the passage of time for records to be declassified, personal records like uh, correspondence and diaries to be opened up, usually after everybody's gone. You know, most of our privacy rights, not all of them are waived, you know, once, we're, once we are, are deceased. But I think a book like this really sort of challenges me because I think we're finally beginning to piece it together. What exactly happened in 1968? We have more professional distance. A lot of people still all are, are around, but people like me, born after 1968, can begin to piece the, the evidence together like pieces of a puzzle and, and start to examine the year perhaps a little um, more dispassionately. But I think what I also want to leave you with is a broader question. Um, uh, and the question is, what if in U.S. history, at key important moments, politics is not what we thought, not what we learned in textbooks, not what we've been told it is? You know, for people like me uh, who uh, look at politics from the cheap seats, really looking at actors on a stage, and I'm sort of conditioned to understand what it's supposed to be like. And this is an episode uh, that clearly it was not what we were told. And it makes my mind begin to run wild in terms of are there other moments like this that maybe we don't know about yet? And it, it might take 55 years to make more sense of our own political era today. But I think this ultimately this book and this topic sort of serves as a lesson. Um, I think the power of history and new sources, and, and that's what I try to share with you uh, today here. So thank you very much. Wow. It's a, uh, you've certainly given us a lot to think about and there are many, many questions. So I'm gonna to try to do them as rapid fire as I can. Um, one of the real questions that came up a couple times is as you look at the four sides, as you call it, um, the other side was what was going on internally within the Democratic Party, where in the primary, you had the anti-war candidates getting the majority of the votes, but ultimately the party nominated someone who was perceived as a war hawk. Um, what, what sense do you have that, uh, is there anything that you learned that how that might have influenced the outcome of this election? No, it's it's a it's a great question, and and you know I, I don't know how many books have been written about sixty eight, probably uh, certainly probably hundreds, I suppose, and and some have focused on certain aspects of the campaign and and not others. You know, I, I guess um, I have two ways I'd respond. I think all authors know, um, you know, you you've got a contract. In, in my case, I had one hundred fifty thousand words, and so it was kind of you know how do you, you know, how, what's what's the story you tell? You know, given the parameters, the timeline of a contract, and the amount of space that a publisher is going to give you, and a, a lot's already been written about. Um, uh, the, those other campaigns, it, it seems to me like it, it was a great resource for an author because I think just about every staffer, it seems like, who worked for McCarthy or Kennedy wrote a memoir. And so you have all kinds of helpful guides already on the record. Um, you're right. I mean, both parties, there was a, the, the not just the nation was divided, but those within the parties were very divided. Uh, I would say not just Democrats, but even on the Republican side. There, there are still today a few Goldwater Republicans still with us. And if you talk to them, of course, they, you know, they lost in a landslide to Lyndon Johnson in 1964. But if you talk to them today, they talk as though, you know, they get a sort of twinkle in their eye and they get a wry smile. I mean, they feel that they won in 1964 because they finally got a conservative nominated, you know, as opposed to kind of a liberal internationalist going back to Dewey, you know, in the 40s. So I think I would say not just the Democrats, both parties. Um, you know, have a, have a lot going on, you know, in terms of sort of a, a revolution. The, the younger generation wants something very different than the older generation. Uh, frankly, there were a lot of other great books on that topic. I had less new to say about those. And, and so I really wanted to focus on uh, the people who made the biggest difference in November, because as I say, you know, each of these are sort of, each of them kind of get equal space in the book. There's not really a star in the book. These are co-stars. 
And uh, so my focus really then was more on what prompted the American people to vote the way they did in November. And so that's why I focused on, as I say, these kind of four sides of three that were actually on the ballot in all 50 states, because Wallace was too, not on the DC ballot, but on all 50 states, as well as kind of outgoing President Lyndon Johnson looming very much in the background, hoping to influence things. So that was that was a bit how, kind of how my methodology was as I approached the book. And, you know, your focus on, on Billy Graham and the role that he played, um, is is fascinating, especially because you think about Billy Graham himself was a fairly clear um, speaker on behalf of civil rights. But there are many people who believe that his intervention uh, to move to help move Johnson over to Nixon was set the framework for what we now know as the Southern strategy that really impact, you know, said, okay, we saw, we saw LBJ, he was one of us, a good old Southern good old boy, but then he turned right around and got all those civil rights bill passed. And now we got to move the other direction. How do you, you know, is there anything in the diaries? Is there anything you saw where, um, Billy Graham felt conflicted about that issue? Yeah, I think Graham is fascinating. I think Graham deserves not just, uh, so I, I don't know that I'll be the one to do this. Um, I'm working on a book now on LBJ White House years. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'll, I'll still, some of these threads that we're talking about will continue in that book, but I think Graham is really deserving of his own book uh, and, and maybe more than one. There's so many angles and there's so much new source material that's on the way out. I think Graham and Johnson had, had a lot in common. Um, you know, the, the, this, they're both from a part of the South that was very much coming up for grabs politically in the late 1960s. Graham from North Carolina. Johnson, I mean, don't forget Southerners. I, I lived in LBJ country for a long time on the faculty of Texas A&M. You know, real Southerners didn't really consider Johnson to be a Southerner. Uh, they considered Lady Bird to be a Southerner because she she was born in East Texas, more like over by the Louisiana border. But Johnson sort of didn't talk like them. I mean, didn't always sometimes betrayed some of their principles. Uh, and, you know, he, he would sometimes send her to go talk to them at, at a speech because he, he sometimes would say, you know, she sounded like they, you know, they, they sounded like she did when, when she spoke. So, I, I, you know, Graham, I think beginning with this Chattanooga um, rally, I think it was in 53 was Chattanooga, had always had, uh, had always, always never, never uh, even, even in venues that were officially segregated, you know, didn't follow those rules, uh, never followed segregation pro-civil rights, always claimed he was a lifelong Democrat, um, but that didn't tell you how he voted all the time. You know, I think he voted for the, the person on the ticket and not always a party. I do think he was a Democrat, but but one of mi mi millions probably who went for Eisenhower uh, and then maybe went for Nixon in 60. I'm not sure. It's not That's not in the diary. Probably came back to Johnson in 64, went to Nixon and probably became what we might call a Reagan Democrat beginning in the 1980s. So in terms of the Southern strategy, you know, anybody can Google Southern strategy, especially Nixon Southern strategy, and there's been plenty written about that. My, my take on that, like a lot of other things in the book, is a little different, simply because with Wallace in the race, the Southern strategy changes completely. Uh, I would actually argue that we really, well, two points. One, if you show me any election and you show me a candidate who didn't have a strategy in the South, you'll probably show me the loser in that election. This is a very important voting block in the country. And I would actually argue because of Wallace in the race and being on the ballot in all 50 states that we really didn't see a Southern strategy uh, in 1968 because Humphrey and Nixon didn't want to compete with Wallace. They certainly didn't want to appear on a debate stage. There were no major debates in 1968 with Wallace on that stage. Uh, and Wallace, uh, Wallace could could take all those voters, you know, who might have been more vote, motivated on issues like race and civil rights. And Nixon and Humphrey didn't didn't compete, didn't want to compete with the rhetoric and could concede that whole territory. I think what Nixon's Southern strategy might have been had it been a two man race, it would have been very different because Humphrey and Nixon would have had to have competed directly in the South for those voters on those issues. If you go back to those blue and red political maps of Eisenhower, Nixon in 52 and in 56, Eisenhower began to claw back some of that traditional democratic territory, uh, winning Virginia twice, 56, 52 and 56, winning Louisiana even in 1956. 
I think Nixon's southern strategy might have been to, to chip away and hold that territory that Eisenhower had begun to run. But ultimately, I would agree, we really never saw a proper southern strategy in 68 because Humphrey and Nixon didn't need to visit the Deep South or campaign there. And in the book, you talk about the anti-elite uh, you know, framework of George Wallace's campaign and how that set the stage for what we now know as Trumpism. Would you like to expound on what did you learn and where did you, you know, what kind of resources were there about that information? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, everybody wants to know kind of what we can extract from 68 to illuminate the present. You know, some people will say that, you know, history is always about the present. You know, how can we apply things today? Um, and uh, I don't think I use, it's not my style to use Trump's name in a book like this. Um, so I don't, I don't think it appears once, as far as I know. Somebody will surely fact check me on that and let me know, but I don't think it's in there. Uh, in part because I don't think it's needed. I think that part of the book comes across already without any extra helping hand on my part. I would really argue Wallace was, Wallace is something that we don't see very often in politics, maybe once a generation. And by that, I mean a third party candidate who really made a difference potentially uh, in the outcome. It's been since Ross Perot, probably in 20, 20, 25 years, 92, 96 since we had a candidate who who did make a, a potentially a decisive difference in terms of his presence on the ballot. Uh, and with Wallace, I would argue very much anti-elite, anti-establishment. By 68, he wasn't really talking about race at all, uh, directly, overtly, the way he was earlier in the decade, 62 and 63, when he promised segregation today, tomorrow, forever, standing in the schoolhouse door to prevent integration at the University of Alabama. He was not talking like that by 68. I think the concern about race was still there, um, kind of folded into a more sophisticated set of grievances. And if you were a voter who was motivated on the issue of race or civil rights or concern about those subjects, uh, you didn't need to hear Wallace talking about that in 68 because you already knew that he was your, can he was your candidate. Uh, he, that's where you were going to go, you know, in terms of uh, who you would vote for in November. So I, yes, to, my takeaway is I would argue that all kind of anti-establishment, anti-elite candidates on both sides of the aisle uh, who run sort of as a populist have borrowed from the Wallace playbook, uh, more recently more so the Republicans because of the, the looming, the huge presence of Trump in Republican politics today. Um, but th this is a traditional Democratic voting base. I mean, the last candidate to win this voting, this, this, these voters as a block was Lyndon Johnson in 1964. These traditional blue collar, lower middle class, you know, typically union, you know, uh, members. Um, and it's really interesting that that now a populist billionaire who's a Republican is the one really going after them. So politics has really been turned on its head. Luke, this is so fascinating and we've got a whole new set of questions we're up against our hour almost mm -hmm. and so what we're going to do is we always acknowledge that some people are actually on their lunch hour um and so we're going to close and then come back for bonus minutes um because you've agreed to stay with us and uh so keep putting in your questions and we will plow through them as best as we can um we want to Thank everybody for their support, for your participation, um, and remind you, as we always do, that our ability to provide these programs at the United States Capitol Historical Society is because we have the support of donors and contributors and members. So if you're not a member, please join. Uh, we're going to show you quickly the upcoming events. Um, so check out the upcoming events. Um, we've got coming up, we have a, a good series of things, bipartisanship in U.S. foreign policy. Um, we have a whole new set of, uh, a whole new set of things. Um, we're going to hear from Bert Griffin, also from Ohio, another Ohioan. I know, Luke, you're considering Ohio and being a Bowling Green guy. Uh, Bert Griffin, who was on the staff of the Warren Commission, is going to talk about, as we look at the 60th anniversary of that activity, um, and Fergus Bordewick, who's written a new book about the Klan war and the battle to save Reconstruction that includes some fascinating uh, research from congressional hearings. So we hope you'll join us for all of these.
you can take a look at the QR code or you can come to our website. Um, everybody who's registered for this event um, will get a notice with the upcoming events and with the link to the video. This, this forum is being videotaped. It will be shared on our website so that you can take a look at it. If you've got thoughts or ideas of people who you might want to see it, it is there for posterity. So that is our official end. Now we're in bonus time. Um, so Luke, bonus time. Let me let me tell you this. Um, we got several questions about the Paris peace talks and did Nixon really try to sabotage the Paris peace talks and did Johnson know that? And what what what's your sense of that whole drama? Yeah, no, it, it, it's a it's uh, you know, that's that's a question you always expect to come up because it, it's featured so prominently in our recent understanding of the of the campaign. And, you know, that subject, I would say, like a lot of what's in this book, as I say, uh, I will not have the final word. There are still a lot of sources that are classified that are not open. It could be that uh, lots of key figures uh, have not released personal papers, but I'll tell you what I found so far. Um, I think first, you know, I so saw this story, um, the story has been, usually goes by the name, the Chenault Affair, named for Washington socialite Anna Chenault. Uh, the, the, the story, as it's most commonly told, is that Nixon used Anna Chenault to pass a message to the South Vietnamese, President Nguyen Van Thieu, and to say to him um, to stay out of the peace talks and uh, you that you would get a better deal out of a future President Nixon. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the basic outlines of, of that story. And I think, you know, this story has been on the public record since early January 1969. It's been told many times. It, it you know, it goes quiet for a while, then it pops its head back up. And I say, in terms of being transparent about my own preconceived ideas, um, I learned the story and assumed it was either true or at least mostly true. Uh, like, like a lot of things in history. And I, I was surprised when I began to dig, dig into this because I knew that I, I would need to. I have a whole chapter on Anna Chenault and also an appendix that really goes through these uh, set of notes made by uh, Nixon's campaign assistant who becomes the White House Chief of Staff, Bob Haldeman, in the, the final two weeks of the campaign, which have shed some light, further light on, on the story in recent years. And the first thing I was struck by is that it doesn't matter which one, you can name the handful of authors who've written about this subject. They, they never interviewed Anna Chenault. Well, I did. Uh, they never interviewed the South, Vietnam, South Vietnamese and the ambassador to the United States, Boyd Ziem, was alive up until very recently. As, and Tew's personal assistant is still alive today. Uh, they never talked to the South Vietnamese to figure out what was that message that you received from Anna Chenault? And what did it change in your mind in terms of taking part in the peace talks? Uh, that no one had interviewed the remaining members of the Paris peace talks delegation, the U.S. delegation, and there were several of them. There's fewer now. I think about 15 people that I talked to are no longer around. Um, so no one at first, I was immediately suspicious that, that no one had interviewed these people, which suggested to me that maybe this wasn't really deeply researched. The second thing I would say is that I can't prove a negative, you know, logically. I can't prove that Nixon or Chenault weren't up to something. And obviously there's closed evidence. There's 500 hours of Nixon tapes where he, not from this period, but where he reflects beginning in the White House taping system starting in 1971 on earlier periods, including this one, that are not open. But my take in the book ultimately is, while I can't prove that Nixon or Chenault weren't up to something, if you actually look at the, the, the evidence so we're talking about a communication from an American, probably Chenault, to the South Vietnamese that changed their mind not to participate in the peace talks. So that's the basic logic that you can break that down and investigate that. I would say at this point in time, uh, that it's not clear what that communication was. No direct evidence has surfaced. Uh, there's no evidence in the Vietnamese archives, which I spent almost a month in between my last in, in Ho Chi Minh City for my last book and this one. There's nothing in the archives that suggests a message was received or that it changed the mind of Tu to participate. And also more generally, Tu wasn't even part of the peace talks. At that point, we were talking about maybe adding our ally South Vietnam to the talks, but it was mainly between the United States and Hanoi at that point with Russian help. Uh, Saigon didn't officially join the talks until a later period. Uh, 
And even the members of the, del the peace talks delegation said there was no peace. We weren't even there to negotiate peace. And these people, by the way, who are not friendly to Nixon at all politically, who said the only thing we were authorized to negotiate was to continue keep talking into more serious talks and to have a bombing halt, which ultimately was announced just on the eve of the election. So this idea that these were peace talks, there, there weren't really peace talks. These were preliminary talks to then enter hopefully more serious talks that did begin, you know, during the Nixon administration to get out of the war, which took four more, almost four more years. So I would argue that while this story has been on the public record for a long time and certainly part of the conventional wisdom, like a lot in history, if you go back and check the sources, it's a little more complicated and nuanced. And I would argue it really doesn't add up to very much. But at the same time, I keep my mind open, lots of closed materials. And as I say, I can't prove a negative that Nixon or Chanel were not up to something. But I would argue in any court of law, an attorney who took this case and had to 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 you know to to make a convincing argument to a jury that that the evidence is is pretty thin. And if you look at your your, your you posit that Nixon and Johnson were you know working together behind the scenes with the guidance of Billy Graham, but that was all behind the scenes. Publicly, he had endorsed his former vice president. At what point do you think there was, is there anything that you learned about, were people wondering, were people questioning it at the time? Um, what, and what about Humphrey? What was he opining at the time? No, it's a, it's a great question. Of course, politicians later in their lives write memoirs. Um, but what you want to really understand is, is, as you describe it, what were they thinking at the time? And that's hard to separate out sometimes, sort of memory from, from history. I would say that the American public, at least as judging by the, the headlines and newspapers at the time, were, were not really on to the fact there might have been a division between Johnson and Humphrey. Uh, those closest to Johnson and Humphrey were, and you can look at the private papers of Clark Clifford, uh, Averill Harriman. Clark Clifford was Secretary of Defense. Averill Harriman was was uh, leading or co-leading the Paris Peace Talks with future Secretary of State uh, Cy Vance. Uh, so those closest were were aware that while officially Johnson said everything that was proper, he issued I would call a very lukewarm endorsement of Humphrey. He had really one major campaign appearance with Humphrey at the Astrodome in Houston uh, in the final days of the campaign, which now if you go back and look at it, I think it really was more about putting the spotlight on LBJ himself rather than, than Humphrey. It was sort of Johnson's farewell to politics you know, in his home state before the home crowd, basically, at the Astrodome. So I think those closest who had access to inside information, which the public did not, which journalists covering the campaign certainly did not, and this is what the power of sources that become available decades later in archives is they challenge us to revisit these preconceived ideas. So I think people were on to something. Clifford and Harriman were saying, well, it sure seems like, you know, Johnson's doing very little for Humphrey and makes me wonder if maybe he's secretly for Nixon. Those concerns were being raised and are raised in their later memoirs that were written. Harriman's papers are there in the Library of Congress. Clifford's, uh, are, a lot of his papers are at the job LBJ Library and, and elsewhere. And so you can see the private concerns about, uh, you know, things are not lo looking very good uh, for Hubert Humphrey. But I would add one more thing. I think Humphrey had a very difficult time campaigning. Uh, and it's If you look at any race and you see someone who's the current vice president, that's a very, you, you have really the hardest job in politics. Because to organize your campaign around a meaningful theme, uh, because you, you're the you're you 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 want the endorsement of the outgoing president, and so you have this awkward task of arguing that that well everything we've done for the last four or eight years is of course great, uh, but yet somehow there's still more to do. You know, then the cynic says, well, if, if it's so, if you have more to do, why didn't you do it already? And Nixon had gone through this in 60, this awkward task of running for president while vice president. I would argue Al Gore in 2000, which I remember vividly, had a similar challenge. Hillary Clinton, to a degree, while in 2016, while not vice president, played a, a prominent role in the Obama administration as secretary of state and was seen to be very close and tied to the policy of the administration. I think she had a version of that challenge. 
to be connected to the popular things, but not, but not to be close to things that were unpopular, to seek that the outgoing president's endorsement in parts of the country where it serves your purpose, but to seem independent in others, it's very awkward to do that. Nixon had done that in 60. He understood that Humphrey had that same challenge in 68. And so I would argue we really never saw a Humphrey campaign operating on all cylinders it was capable of because under those conditions and the turbulence of the year, it was really difficult to get a campaign uh, up and running. And, you know, one more to return to the Chenault uh, affair. It, it's been sort of common understanding that Johnson called both Senators Russell and Senators Durkin, Dirksen uh, to complain about Nixon's meddling um, and identified his activities as treasonous at that time. Is that not true? Or is that, you know, how does that fit into this different understanding you have of the Chenault affair? No, uh, what you what you say there, the, the line that he says to uh, Republican Senate leader Everett Dirksen of Illinois, uh, this is treason, is the very first line on the very first page of this book. So this is not a subject that I shy away from. And, you know, when I give a talk, I try to be transparent in terms of these are facts and this is more of my speculation. I hope it's informed speculation sometimes. And I think when you talk about this subject, it does require a bit of speculation. And there are things that I don't know. And I try to be candid about that. Um, as someone, I, I think perhaps I've done more work, uh, more years of my career working on White House tapes than maybe any other single person. And tapes are difficult as a source of evidence because this 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 line, you know, this is Johnson saying this is treason comes from a tape that Johnson knew he was making a recording of. And uh, taping systems up until Nixon were all manually operated. I think as if there were, we're talking about rational human beings here, beginning in 1940 when FDR had the first system installed. Um, the, the system was turned on when it served the president's interest, and I assume it was turned off when it serves the president's interest. And there are times that they are speaking for the record. Nixon's is sound activated. His tapes are a different type of evidence, even though it's also a secretly recorded tape. So this 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 recording uh, with with Dirksen especially, um, I, I'm not exactly sure what to make of this. Uh, Johnson on his tapes has an awful lot of bluster. He vents a lot, just like Nixon does. And it's difficult as historians, how do we consume that information? How do we know that what Johnson's saying is what he really thinks? Or a, a lot of times Nixon does a similar thing, Kennedy does it too. He would have kind of an extreme reaction. And his goal really is to, to sort of solicit as much information from the other side, the person that he's talking to or meeting with at the moment. And, and actually, you, you when the conversation's over with you, realize I really didn't learn a lot about what Johnson actually thinks. It seems like his, he had a device to figure out what the other side thought a lot of times. And he kept his counsel uh, much to himself and played his cards very close to the vest. So he does say that. It's not clear what Johnson means by treason. Uh, obviously, both in his memoirs and Humphreys, ultimately, he, the, he concluded otherwise, that it wasn't treason and that Nixon wasn't directly involved. And I like to think that Johnson, in command of all the intelligence agencies, uh, had a greater access to data and information that, than even I do, do now, 55 years later. And so I think he probably looked at all the facts, and, and that was the conclusion that he came to, is ultimately that, that it wasn't treason. But you're absolutely right that in, said in the heat of the moment, that is exactly what Johnson said. And I'm not sure why he said it. I'm not sure what he meant by it. Um, it's probably one of those things that, that they will continue to chew on in the future. Well, this is fascinating. Uh, we could go on all day, but we will not do that. We thank you so much for your for your time, for your talent. Here's here's your last your opportunity for the last word. It's been said that LBJ said the president has to have a killer instinct. Uh, you're a presidential historian. You've been looking at presidents. Uh, what do you think about that comment? Hmm. Well, and I think uh, how I answer as a as a human being, as a voter, uh, as a call it a fellow stakeholder in our democracy is different than as a historian who's looking at dusty records and archives. I think the lens of history says it, it might be true. Uh, I think as a human being, I, I hope not. You know, I, I think Humphrey uh, would have been a great president. I think in 1960 to focus on traditional democratic prosperity issues, jobs, education, 
um, uh, certain, the economy, social security. And I, I think he would have been a tremendous president on those things uh, when certainly the skill set required was not not having a killer instinct. But I think presidents also, don't forget, are commander in chief. And as commander in chief, they have to make snap decisions as unemotionally as possible based on incomplete information and according to less than desirable timetables. And so presidents as having the final say during wartime, obviously, you know, need to have an understanding about life and death and that great weight of your decision that, that it, it, you know, lives are lost at times. So I would say hopefully not routinely, but I think potentially any president can become a wartime policy. But when I think you had to have, you have to have a great understanding and awareness of how, how, how really serious that, that duty is. Professor Nichter, it's fascinating. And I've read most of the book, but not all of it. Now I want to go back and finish it. Um, I hope our, our, our listeners will do the same. Thank you for contributing your time and your talent to be with us. We appreciate getting to know you. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Be well. We look forward to seeing you soon. Be well. Goodbye.